Hey, welcome to the New American Veteran. Well, let's get this started off right here since the show officially kicks off at the top of the hour. We're going to open up with a little bit of music from Iron Glide, which is rapidly becoming one of my favorite groups. So enjoy. Stand by. I was born with only one way to go Life of the drifters, all I know Go home, I came off stealing steam Living my life street to street You opened my eyes, that will be your man Dumb chains of freedom with a withered end. I'll be a warrior. Live straight to my hand. Command me as I defend this broken land. I'll be a warrior. Your fight is now mine. Walk with me. This is Madison Rising and the Star Spangled Banner. Whoa. 
God and country, do what's just, boys, go do what's right. A hot band of brothers waiting on our chance to add one more page unto the victory dance. Here am I, Lord, send me, send me. Victory lies in the spirit of the lives of the men who died for me. Then I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Send me. This is Michael Browder, Marine Corps veteran, actor, and Gallant Few board member. You are listening to the new American veteran on Vets on Media. Now here's Carl Monger. Well, good afternoon. Welcome back and Happy New Year. It's been a couple of weeks. I think actually it's before Christmas since we did the last broadcast. And, <clears throat> excuse me, well, one of the next broadcasts I'm going to do, I'm going to get Corey Smith on here. He, uh, as you most of you already know he's the genesis behind the Run Ranger Run movement. 
and as he has gone through his his own transition now, he just this last week has been testing for his uh, license in in nursing. Amazing guy, amazing story, and he has just absolutely accelerated into his transition into civilian life. So we're going to bring him on and get an update on what's going on. But in the meantime, thank you for being here and good afternoon. Today is January the 13th, 2015, and welcome to Gallant Fuse, the New American Veteran. TNAV is a broadcast of Gallant Few Inc., a 501c3 nonprofit. And our mission is to prevent veteran isolation by connecting new veterans with hometown veteran mentors, thereby facilitating a peaceful and successful transition from military service to a civilian life filled with hope and purpose. Our goal is to connect every new veteran with a hometown veteran mentor, no matter where they are. We do this by creating and supporting a nationwide network of successfully transitioned veterans that engage locally with new veterans with the same military background themselves now going through transition. We believe this will prevent veteran unemployment, homelessness, and suicide. I was uh, experimenting earlier with my camera. <clears throat> so I'm a little bit, it's a little off here. Let me make a little adjustment if I can. So I was like standing up and uh, trying to make sure that the camera had the right angle on me. So then when I sat down and started the broadcast, I, I looked like a Smurf because all you can see is the top of my forehead. So I got that fixed and uh, we're back up and rolling. I want to give a quick shout out and recognition to Ranger veteran Chris Bemis. Uh, Chris has done a lot of things for the veteran community. Chris has gone through his own demons and struggles and, and continues to this day. I, he's one of the one of my friends that motivate me every single time I hear their voice, look at their picture, get a message from them because he's paralyzed mid chest down and his spirit is absolutely undefeatable. A couple of years ago, that's not the case because he tried to take his own life. And uh, when you learn about all the things that go into his situation, you know, you kind of understand why he was at the point that he was. Well, thank God that didn't happen. And he was unsuccessful at that attempt because now he is making a big difference in the lives of veterans. Later on, I'm going to play a, a, a public service announcement that he recorded about drinking and driving, which is why he's paralyzed from the mid-chest down. And I also want to welcome him to the New American Veteran because Chris Bemis is now becoming the producer for the New American Veteran. So we're wrestling through what does the back end side of YouTube and a Google Hangout look like? When can we put different links and, and different things up on the screen while we're talking and how do we bundle it better so that we reach a larger veteran audience because they need to hear what uh, the entire population of the United States needs to know what veterans go through as they transition. Uh, we need to find all of the great resources that are out there and we need to highlight veterans like Ranger Irving that I'm going to bring on here in just a couple of minutes because they have taken their experiences and they have turned them into, we talked in my, in my beginning about having a uh, life that's filled with peace and hope, purpose and hope. When someone has taken their military experience and turned that into a book or when, and somebody has taken their military experience and applied the things that they learned at leadership into managing a bank or running their own business or whatever it is that they've decided to do post-military service, there are other veterans that are coming along in our footsteps a year, two years, 10 years down the road that want to do, maybe one of them wants to write a book, maybe one of them wants to manage a bank, one of them wants to be an attorney. I'm not sure why, but there's got to be some that are out there because I've got some friends that are going to kick my butt now after I said that. But how do they go from being an 11 Bravo to being an attorney, a partner in a law firm in Los Angeles? And like Rick Welsh is, one of the Gallup few board of directors. I mean, to go from a private and ranger battalion to be in this, this high-powered lawyer in Los Angeles, that is light, year, light years apart in terms of existence. And, and it's pretty cool that that kind of stuff happens, and it validates every time we talk about the value of, uh, of a military veteran and especially a ranger. So that's what the purpose of all, everything that Gallup Few does, everything that the New American Veteran blog and talk show are aimed about, is to highlight what's going on in the veteran world and then let veterans out there know that there is a way to achieve a peaceful, safe transition filled with purpose and hope. So without uh, continuing to babble on here, today's guest is 3rd Ranger Battalion veteran uh, Nicholas Irving. Nicholas, welcome to the New American Veteran. Uh, how are you? I'm doing outstanding. Thank you. 
Uh, you're a veteran of the 3rd Ranger Battalion, and, and just from some of the stuff I picked up out of your book, you graduated RIP back when RIP was hard before they turned it into RASP, and we got to talk about that oh. in a minute. Uh, machine gunner, machine gunner, team leader, grenadier, team leader, marksman, sniper, sniper, team leader, master sniper. Um, amazing military career that you stacked into a very short period of time, relatively. Oh, yeah, I was, I was young and just wanted it all at, this, at, the, at the time. Just wanted everything. I, I liked uh, what you were talking about. You originally wanted you saw <laughs> you saw the movie the uh, the Navy Seals. That was your motivation to go to the military. Can oh yeah. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, I hear you. Yeah, you were there for a minute. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, so uh -huh. so uh, Todd, I was. How was your book? Uh, how was writ? A little bit of uh, warble in and out. Oh yeah, let's see. There we go. Was it writ you were asking about? Well, uh, your motivation to enter the military. You saw the Navy SEALs movie with Charlie Sheen, if I remember right, and that was your initial motivation. Oh yeah, my initial motivation. I think I was uh, still in elementary school when I wanted to be a Navy SEAL at the time, and you know, I saw the movie. I watched the the Chuck Norris movie too, Delta Force, and I wanted to do something along those lines, but especially the Navy SEAL movie, um, and to be a Navy SEAL. I it, went into anything. those movies were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> those those movies were horrible. Oh they, my! Gosh. Yeah, they were pretty. Looking looking back looking back at it, they were pretty bad. They're ideally suited for an elementary school kid, though. Perfect. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, Give so, me motivation to not do homework and watch movies all day. Exactly. So, so how did you go from wanting to be a Navy SEAL to becoming an Army Ranger? Well, it wasn't really up to me. I was I, I was enrolled into the Navy Sea Cadet Corps, almost like the Navy ROTC program. I went through their Mock Buds uh, course and passed that. We took the actual Navy SEAL PT test and passed that to swim. And you know, after that course, I became scuba qualified. I was uh, 15 at the time, and I thought it was all set in stone. I was going to be a SEAL. I went to the uh, MEP station to take my color vision test, and that's where I learned that I was colorblind. My mom always knew it. She just never told me. That's why she had to, I mean, uh, pretty much dress me all the way till I guess, 12th grade. I would put on purple pants. I thought they were black and a green shirt or something. So she knew I was colorblind, but I had no clue. So that's what uh, ended that that dream. Yeah, but you drove on. You figured out, out a way to overcome. If I remember right from your book, you figured out a way to get past that colorblind test. And, uh, oh, yeah. and that's fully I went home and I thought that I could study for the color vision test to try to. There's only so many out there, so I was going to memorize every single pattern there was and the numbers that were in there. I didn't really have to do that. I had this army nurse. Uh, she heard my story <laughs> and she decided to lie for me on the color vision test. And she asked, did I want to be an Army Ranger? So I was like, yeah, if they're like SEALs, I want to be an Army Ranger. I had no idea what those guys were. Well, I'm, I'm glad that uh, she helped you get through the process. And uh, oh, you enlisted, yeah. went, you went through RIP and very, how many out of your original RIP class? So it was like 1% that graduated or something like that? Yeah, we started with around 80 plus guys, and we graduated seven total. Uh, six from the original 80. We had one rollover, so seven, seven total. Yeah, so about 10 percent. That's that's amazing. That's quite an accomplishment. And, uh, I was, and you, that was bad. Ahead. It was bad. Yeah, uh, you you talked about some of the uh, some of the same places at Fort Benning that I remember. The Nightland Nav Course, in particular, is one of my Absolutely favorite places in the world, not. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I was thinking, whoa, cold range, that's not a, no, not a good place. Uh, so right at the very beginning, when you got into the introduction to your book, and I'll hold up a copy of it, and, and a couple of times through here, we want to make sure and highlight the book and then talk about how people can go get a copy of it. Um, you talked about having to flip the switch, flip the switch mm -hmm. between downrange and home. Can you talk oh, just a little bit about what that means? Uh, pretty much before I would go on a deployment, um, I'd have to flip this switch to become something that I wasn't brought up to be or something that 
uh, I wasn't raised in a family where it was violent and, you know, a lot of killing and stuff like that. So I was brought up a certain way. And to go overseas and do a job to do, you have to become somebody else. And I think through all the training that the 75th put us through, allow me to be able to come that individual that uh, needed to perform overseas. Uh, pretty, you know, a violent guy uh, in, in a few words. Pretty much just a violent individual. Um, without warning, without remorse. One of those type guys. And getting back home, um, I want to say it took about a day to actually decompress. I mean, there was a few, few occasions where we'd be on an operation and 48 hours, 72 hours, we're back at home with our loved ones. And getting back into that transition of, you know, not being that guy, uh, it was a challenge, but it was just that switch that had to be uh, turned on and off. It didn't always happen that way. I tried, you know, as hard as I could, but I was, I was 18. I think my first experience when I took, uh, when I killed an individual overseas in Iraq, and getting back home after that experience at the age of 18, it was hard to turn that switch off, and I was in a I don't think I was right a little bit. There was a lot of drinking going on. Uh, I don't think I've ever been been that drunk in my life. But just a, over the years, of learning how to turn that switch off it was it was a challenge. But I think every ranger that I've talked to that's come back has gone through a phase of that where they they try to self medicate. Some of them self medicate through PT. You know, just try to dump as much endorphins into their body as they can. But it, it's you know basically. Yeah. It still works out to be kind of the same kind of thing, and, and that's actually what I just started getting into. What's that? That's actually what I just started getting into, like heavy PT. I got a gym upstairs. Drink it too much. What's that? It's a better alternative than drink it too much. Oh well, yeah, definitely. Carry it in excess too. Definitely. <laughs> um, definitely. You don't talk any in your book about your transition out and if we have time and if you're willing to talk a little bit about that we can mm -hmm. but first let, let's focus on the book because you got a the nickname that's the title of the book the Reaper really quick the first one of the first missions that you went out with the third ranger battalion you want to talk about getting that nickname and how that came about oh yeah definitely it was a uh, 2009 we ripped out to uh, Helmand, Afghanistan, the Kandahar region, Kandahar, Afghanistan. And our first operation out, we were maybe wills down for 24, 48 hours, and we had our first operation. I'm a sniper team leader, and uh, me being colorblind, whenever they uh, highlight the objective and the routes we're taking with the red laser on a big map, I, I could never see that red dot. So my spotter, Mike, he would have to tell me, hey, you know, the... the Lasers right there, lasers right there, and I'm tracking. Um, my first stop out, I, I didn't really know what to expect as a sniper team leader. I knew I had a guy underneath me that I had to uh, essentially take care of or watch out for, but you know, it's uh, he would do the same for me too, and he did. And our first stop out, I ended up killing I think two guys that first operation, and my spotter ended up getting one. And immediately after the next day, I think I got one or two more guys. And I walked into the debrief room, and one of the squad leaders, our platoon sergeant, said that I was batting a thousand or something. And I'm not a big baseball guy; I'm, you know, a big football guy. But when he said I was batting a thousand, I was like, "What does that mean? I don't even, I don't know what that means." And he's like, "Dude, you're every time you go out, you're getting guys. You're like the angel of death." And numbers started to increase. And I think it was third squad ended up tagging me the name of the Reaper. And that's where it all started from there. That's quite an honor to get a, a nickname like that from the, especially peers in a Ranger Battalion, because oh yeah, you know, it's it's such a tight community. It's a, you can't really describe the environment to anybody who hasn't been in there. So yeah. I know that's a pretty special deal. You had made a comment, and I and I wrote this down out of the book yesterday. I want to read it word for word, so make sure that I don't mess it up. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's talking about it as your uh, your in school, I think, maybe learning math. And you said, if someone had told me that math would apply to sniping, I might have paid more attention. And oh, the yeah. more you read about sniping, the more you made the connection between chess and shooting. Anticipation, analysis, and prediction based on evidence are pretty high-level thinking skills. Uh, they absolutely are high-level thinking skills. And I like the fact that you wrote that in the book because <clears throat> I use an example sometimes when I'm talking to 
civilian audiences about veterans and the value that they can bring to a workplace. And I, I use an example of a bank and a sniper. You know, if a mm -hmm. bank is uh, wanting to hire somebody and a veteran walks in and they hand them their resume and on it it says they were a sniper in the military, the bank's probably going to say, hey, you know, that's real nice, thanks for your service, but we don't need a sniper at the bank. But if you take all of yeah. the skills that go into what a sniper has to do, and you know it better than anybody else, between the mathematical calculations you have to do on the fly, you have to adjust for environmental conditions, you have to be hypersensitive to conditions around you, you have to have perfect inventory, you've got to be able to plan, resupply. I mean, when you translate all of those things into running a bank and taking care of money, it's a no-brainer that skills like that could be very effective in the other environment. So you want to talk a little bit about your experience with that, how you think things connect? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, well, as a kid, I remember I used to live in Germany up to the age of three or four. I think we left at the age of four. But my dad, uh, I still have the pictures. He would sit me down in front of the chess table and teach me how to play chess. And every time I see him once a year, uh, we still play chess to this day. So that chess plays a big part of my thinking process. I always think two, three steps ahead of, you know, uh, what I think life should be or my I guess uh, what I want to do in life. I don't ever plan for just the immediate. I plan for the next two or three events you know, in the future. Sure. And I, at least I try to. And as far as the math, uh, I was I graduated with a 1.7 GPA. I was not supposed to be some Harvard, you know, college graduate or something like that. But when I got into the, the sniper section, uh, math really wasn't that hard for me. I think because. Uh, it's something that I really wanted to do as a you know as a kid or since I was a kid. So I opened my mind up and kind of you know accepted the fact that math is you know it could determine whether I'm going to live or die or one of my one of my brothers is going to you know come home or not. So I took math really seriously. I hunkered down on it, and it got to the point where I can still to this day do mathematical equations and long division formulas and barometric pressure formulas in my head somewhat not so much barometric but distance and range and leads I can do in my head you know pretty pretty fast and overseas there was a time where uh, you'd get uh, a guy pop up somewhere and you'd have to make this really fast equation and he's two mils high and I do the equation I know it's 1016 but I drop it down to 1000 so two and a two thousand is 500 but the actual equation is 1016 so He's 508 yards away, or meters away. That was not even too much or too fast, but my brain. I, I have trouble adding 24 and 24 sometimes. Okay. <laughs> I yeah. my strong points. I'm glad they make calculators because I, I, oh. I put on a calculator. So I, I use math and chess a lot, you know, uh, and, and things I do now, especially being a, a small business owner and, you know, things of that nature. I Math is a big, big uh Big takeaway from what the military gave me. You want to talk a little bit about your business? What what, oh, uh, yes. what do you do? Everybody from Olympic shooters. I actually I did an, an Olympic shooter, Amanda Fewer. Uh, hopefully she makes it to the Olymp uh, Olympics this year and gets the gold. But I trained her and worked with her last year. Um, special operations units, uh, various law enforcement law enforcement units, ATF, DEA. Um, Department of Homeland Security guys, civilians. I pretty much just uh, run a precision rifle uh, shooting course. And I bring in a lot of uh, good knowledge too, so um, tier one operators come in and they can give their knowledge on what they've learned to become a really good precision rifle shooter or a sniper. And by the end of the course, nine times out of nine, the individual uh, shoots you know, really, really good by the, by the end of the course. Uh, we're hitting targets out to a mile, and it's a it's a good feeling seeing someone come into that course only being able to shoot 300 yards, and now they're hitting targets out to a mile. It's a it's a good good feeling. Well, um, do you have a website for your business? Uh, it's hard shoot, and I'm going to transfer or transfer that LLC to my new LLC, which is uh, 33 degrees. So I'll have that 2015 calendar, um, especially after the book and all that stuff comes out. It should be up and running by then. The transfer and uh, different course outline. We'll have some uh, helo shoots, helicopter rides, and things of that nature. Very nice. So, uh, so for now, what uh, website? You say has it already gone to 
the new website, or is it still the old one? Oh, it's still open. Uh, the new calendar is not up yet, but it's hardshoot, H-A-R-D-S-H-O-O-T dot com. Hardshoot dot com. Okay, I'll make sure and include that in the wrap-up on the show when I do it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you go about publishing a book? Uh, did, did you, as you were leaving active duty, did it, did somebody put a bug in your ear that says, hey, man, you ought to write a book about your experiences? Or how did no, you... I, I went into the contracting world, and I contracted for a few different uh, de companies and overseas and stuff like that. And uh, one of the coolest things I did contracting, I think I was, work, I was working the south border of Texas out here. That was, what, two years ago. So two years ago is when I pretty much stopped contracting, and I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, after that, I knew I wanted to open up a shooting range, and that was already in the works. But as far as the book came along, I was going through, I guess you could say, one of those withdrawals of not being able to uh, do what you trained so, so many years to do. And I looked through these notes. I went to my garage, and I have a bunch of duffel bags, and I kept a lot of notes from overseas. And I wanted to I actually talk to my dad, and he said, you should write it down, and maybe it's a, it's a good stress reliever or... Uh, it's almost like therapy. So I start started to take notes of everything that I did overseas, and slowly but surely, over a few months, it turned into a self-published book. And I was still going through the whole alcohol thing, so I pretty much wrote that book completely uh, non-coherent, and that didn't really turn out too great. But I met up with a business owner, um, Navy Seal Brandon Webb, and he introduced me to an editor at St. Martin's Press and I sent him a copy of what I thought could potentially be a book and the next day I got a phone call from St. Martin's asking could they actually uh, buy the rights off of it and and turn this into a into a book it was something that's not um, you know a chest beating look at me type I'm a hardcore killer you know it's a lot of different life experiences in the book that I think could benefit you know the average civilian to guys who are struggling with you know, getting back home and getting out of the military. Um, like I always tell people who ask, I'm not supposed to be here. I don't think that I should have gotten out of the deployment from 2009. I'm not sure why a few of us did, but it happened, and I shouldn't be. Uh, I shouldn't have a book deal with the, you know, 1.7 GPA and never done anything or thought about doing anything like that in my life. Um, it just happened that way, and it's You're going pretty good. Yeah. You're a perfect example of, of a veteran taking their experiences and turning it into a success post-military. And I, I had just finished reading about that, uh, the 2009 deployment, the one that Ben Kopp was hit on. And yep. his mom has become a very good friend of mine since oh, I've gotten love her. the last few years. It's like my second mom. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, in that firefight, there was a period of time where everything was kind of hopeless to you. And, and if I remember right, you had said something like you were repeating over and over in your head, like, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. And then at some point you realized, oh, I can't keep thinking like that. I have to change my line of thinking to, I got this, I got this, I got this. And oh, that, yeah. was, that was the turning point in the fight for you. Can you talk a little bit about that? And how do you, I mean, you're in such a, at that moment in time, you don't know that you're going to be alive in the next 10 seconds, but you mm -hmm. force your mind to switch the way that it's thinking, and you're able to take that to survival. Talk about that. Well, it started, I think I have slowly drifted into that state of mind after not sleeping for four days straight. Um, it started to, things started to kind of play on my psyche a little bit, and I remember as a, as a, as a kid, I always wanted to, you know, watching the movies, you want this epic firefight, and go out in a blaze of glory to end your career and everything like that, and I always wanted that. And that mission is when it actually happened. I think it was a, close to an eight- or nine-hour firefight, and for three of those hours I was pinned down. My uh, reconnaissance team, uh, awesome guys, we were pinned down by a Chechen sniper and a 360 ambush for three hours. Um, it was a... I don't know why we made it out. A lot of guys had bullet holes inside their clothing and stuff like that, but I think what maybe changed changed my way of thinking was, you know, after hearing Ben Cop screaming and looking at blood and all this stuff uh, flowing down that little ravine, um, I kind of went into a shock. And anyone who says, "Oh man, you're you're a coward for 
thinking that way or going in, into shock. I mean, I was 22 years old, and I never, I've never, I've seen guys get shot plenty of times, but guys that you look at as heroes and your brothers, that really takes a toll on you. And I shut down for a few seconds where everything went really, really super slow motion, and sounds were kind of muffled. And it took a I think it was one of the, one of the reconnaissance guys or my spotter. He hit me on my head on my helmet, and we started engaging some more targets uh, before our. I think it was the PL who got hit behind me. Um, and I really didn't care if I died or not at that point. I just wanted it, you know, to be over. I was tired. I was hungry. Um, guys are getting hit. This sniper's, you know, keened in. He's got a really good keen eye for me and my uh, my, my spotter and the combo guy on the recce team. I just wanted something to happen. You know, I'd been shot at, you know, a lot of close calls that day, and I was like, pretty much, man, I just hope one, you know, connects and let it be fast or something like that. Just want it to be over. But I think looking at the guys and uh, all the things we had been through, I didn't want to leave those guys behind, and I thought that what I, what I could do was, you know, turn the tide or somehow get a few more guys that would potentially get us. So I had to bounce back and... It wasn't really for me at that moment to save my life. I wanted to, you know, make sure that didn't happen again. You know, what happened to Ben Cop and our and our PL. I didn't want that to happen again. Uh, it's an amazing story. Uh, the way oh, yeah. the way that you write, and I know you, you had uh, a co-editor that helped you with the book, but it is. It's almost like a great work of fiction like if you think about a Tom Clancy book or something like that where you just once you pick it up you read the stories and it's really hard to put it down and mm -hmm. it's all a true story and it's about you and and your ranger buddy so that's I mean it's a it's a great book it's very well written and I highly recommend it to anybody out there tell tell us how how do people get a copy of your book and are you going to do any book tours are you going to go out and uh, sit at tables and do book signings or anything like that coming up yeah, I'll do, a, I'll do the book signing. It comes out on the 27th, so I think we're two weeks away, or just under two weeks now, on the 27th of this month. And you can find it on Amazon, uh, barnesandnobles.com, and on the 27th is when it actually will be on shelves in the bookstores. And I'll have, so far we have a few book signings. I know I have a few in New York, and I have one here in San Antonio for February the 7th at Costco. I'll have to get the, the address on that, but we're still working out the logistics as far as book signings and everything uh, uh, that pertains to that. But uh, yeah, you can find it in pretty much any retail bookstore or online, especially on the 27th right now. It's up for pre order. Are you doing a, a website just for the book, like Reaper.com or anything like that? I've stood up a website, uh, Reaper33.com. I haven't worked on it. It's been it's been a while. I think that was one of those things where I wanted to buy the domain before you know somebody I you know that I don't know wanted to obtain that um, that domain name. So I bought that address and I worked on it for a little bit. I might get back to it, but I'm not sure right now. Maybe, maybe. Well, feed me those things, or I'm following you on Facebook too. So I'll mm -hmm. try and pick up on those so that I can spread the word out there because I know especially any rangers that are in the area, when you come to a book signing or something, they're going to want to come out and get an autographed book, and I'll have to drag this book along with me and catch you somewhere, too. You get up to Dallas, number one, you got oh, a yeah. place to stay, because I've got a guest room. If you need a place to stay. Yeah. Just same here in San Antonio. Super. All right. Hey, um, one quick last question, and that is on transition. Do you, do you care to share any about how your transition went, like maybe your – the greatest thing you overcame, or what if you were to give somebody that's getting ready to transition out of the military a little bit of advice, what would you tell them? Uh, my greatest, uh, the greatest thing I overcame was being told that I couldn't do it, especially the economy at the time really sucked. So being told that I couldn't do it and <clears throat> I was only good for, you know, one thing, which was sniping and doing that that job, overcoming that was probably the greatest thing I've ever done. But if I would have had a a plan of action before I got out, maybe a year prior, and actually planned it out and worked a few contacts and got a good resume uh, started. That would have helped out, opposed to what I did. I got out the military and I literally hopped into a, a U-Haul truck and drove to San Antonio. 
I had no plan about what I wanted to do. <clears throat> I knew I wanted to contract maybe, but that was not a definite. Um, but if you started a year out or even longer than that, you know, about things that you want to do when you get out would really, really, really help out. And actually, you know, plan it out the way you would an op order or something like that and check all those boxes. Exactly right. Well, hey, thanks for being on the New American Veteran, Nick. It's a privilege to get to see you face to face, and I look forward to seeing you in person sometime. Definitely, definitely. Thank you for the opportunity. Hey, are you going to be at SHOT Show next week? Negative. I'm going to be in New York next week. Ah, uh, well, enjoy New York. It's going to be a lot colder That's there than we'll be in Vegas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll All right. Thank you. Texas. Appreciate you being on the show. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, over here, i got a couple things to play for you. Okay. This is our first class retired Mike Schlitz. Thank you for listening to Gallant Fuse, the new American veteran on Vets on Media. They teach you a lot in the service. They teach you how to stand straight and fire your rifle. They teach you respect and survival. They teach you how to take a life and how to give your own. What they don't teach you is what happens when you come home. There are over two million people in the U.S. Armed Forces. For some, coming home is the hardest part. As a veteran, you are not alone. Reach out, call about it, but and take the Spartan Pledge to more information, visit us on the web at descendantsofsparta.com. I like that. Absolutely. Vets on Media and Gallant View announce Run Ranger Run a nationwide event to raise awareness of veteran issues. Teams of up to 10 individuals pledge to walk, run, or bike a combined total of 565 miles in the month of February, raising awareness for veteran transition issues and funds for Gallant View. Visit our website, runrangerrun.com, to learn how to join the movement. So why not help some vets have some fun and start getting in shape for spring? Teams are forming all over the country. Are you ready to form yours? To learn more, visit runrangerrun.com. And I got one more little piece about Run Ranger Run. Run Ranger Run is, is pretty simple. A ranger, Corey Smith, was about to get out of the, the Army. And so he decided he was going to run from Fort Benning, Georgia, all the way home to Indianapolis, approximately 565 miles, and he was going to do it in 28 days. Well, Corey, why are you going to run home? And he said, because I want to illustrate the difficult journey that a soldier has becoming a veteran. We realize not everybody is the athlete that Corey Smith was when he did the 565 miles, but we realize you can do it as a team and make it an event. Corey did 565 miles all by himself, and he ran, and he walked, and he biked. So we want 10 people to do 565 miles combined total, running, walking, biking, anything that you can do that you can count distance on. You could have a grandmother walking on a treadmill in the YMCA, you could have a soldier walking patrol in Afghanistan. You could have a kid walking or riding a bike to school. And all of those miles can contribute to that one team total. Run Ranger Run is the most important single event that Gallant Few does. It has a mission of awareness. Gallant Few's mission is to overcome the isolation that veterans may face as they leave active duty. Gallant Few understands that when veterans transition off active duty, that it is an overnight change. Our goal was to set up mentors to welcome that veteran home, both professionally and socially. And we found that if we take veterans who've already been through that process, successfully transitioned, and mentored them up with these new veterans coming off, that it's a perfect match. If I can have 100,000 veterans across the country that are just standing by waiting to mentor a veteran his, he or she leaves active duty, then when that veteran returns to that hometown, they're going to be welcomed, accepted, integrated. They're going to find jobs. They're going to have doors open. The network will be there. And a lot of the issues that we see 
veterans go through as they transition are going to go away. People can get involved with Run Ranger Run by visiting gallantview.org and going under events and looking for Run Ranger Run and all the information on how to get signed up, how to raise awareness, to build teams or become part of a team is all right there at your fingertips. It's a cool event, it's a fun event, and it's an easy one to participate in. That, that was put together for us by the Care Coalition team room, and any veteran oh, that yeah. any veteran that is there we go back <clears throat> that uh, is injured or or wounded. Now it's not just special operations active duty soldiers and veterans that qualify for the team room's resources. It's any veteran of any branch of the service and. They, but they have to have been injured or wounded while they're on active duty. They also have a section of the team room. This is the team room is, it's like, uh, Facebook is not the right term. It's not LinkedIn. It's not Facebook. But it takes things from those with video and chat rooms and things that are fenced off and private for the population. Whether you're a wounded soldier, or whether you're a caregiver for somebody that's got a TBI, it has support mm -hmm. groups in there so you can share information and learn from each other. It's paid for by the government. You don't have to pay a monthly access fee or anything like that to get into it. So um, anybody can go find the Care Coalition's team room by going to team room, carecoalitionteamroom.net. It was on that link that I just showed. Well, hey, again, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate you staying on, learn a little about Run Ranger Run. And, um, oh, yeah. And again, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. All right. I'll keep in touch. All right. Right on. Thank you. You too. Bye. I'm going to, uh, as he leaves here, I'm going to talk just a little bit more about some of the things that have happened with Gallant Few since the uh, the last time we were on the show. We, we went through and compiled, thanks to the Salesforce Foundation, that they have donated, and they do this for any nonprofit that's out there. They donate a certain number of their enterprise seats or licenses for a nonprofit to use, and Salesforce is one of these customer relationship management database tool sets that large corporations like IBM or Coca-Cola, I don't know if they use that, but companies like that use this to manage their sales force and their sales forecast and, and payroll and, and all of that stuff. Uh, so we have learned over this last year a great deal about how to use these Salesforce tools to help us manage and report on what we do. So on December 1st, I went in and I ran a report that showed all the services that we had done for the previous 12 months. And it was 695. Now, that's not 695 veterans because if we have a veteran that is looking for a job and they're also homeless, helping them find a job and fixing the homeless problem, those are two separate services. But by tracking each individual one of those significant services that we provide for a veteran, we can drill into and we can find out how many did we help with various aspects. Um, a huge piece of what we, we do, and I'm going to have to learn maybe a little bit more about how to fence this down closer is human services. So if I'm on the phone talking to a veteran that is in a, a deep depressed state or they, they're having a trigger in, triggered incidence of PTSD and they need someone to literally talk them down off a ledge, that's human services. If um, I take somebody, I've got a group of veterans here, we've created a group in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that every Tuesday and Thursday evening goes and does indoor rock climbing. That's human services. I, I might need to split some of these things out so we're a little bit more specific on what we do. But I can go into each one and I can find out. There's a, a veteran named uh, Joe Sixpack. I can find out what did we do, how many times did we talk to Joe, what kind of resources did we refer. As we go forward into the next year, not only are we already helping more veterans, the pace is completely picked up because as people see what we do, they recognize the value of that and they want to get connected to us. And I've got a lot of folks that are coming that want to help grow this organization. And I'm very thankful for all of them. Um, other nonprofits that are out there, let's collaborate. This is not, uh, serving veterans is not a competition. And I'm not out to steal any of your donation dollars. And I'm really not worried about whether you're going to take any that somebody's going to give to me because I think, or to Gallup, use a, a better term, if people believe in what we do, then they're going to support what we do financially. Um, in the video, I talk about Gallant Fuse Run Ranger Run being 
the single most important event in terms of number one, awareness, because the general population is still ignorant to the fact that 22 veterans commit suicide every day, according to the VA. They're ignorant to the fact that for the last three years on a rolling average, a post 9-11 veteran is 35% more likely to be unemployed than a member of the civilian population that's never put on the uniform and almost 50% more likely to be unemployed than a veteran of my era, the Desert Storm era. When people talk about all oh, the unemployment numbers are good, they're all coming down. When you look at the differences between those populations, that's where you find out where the real problem lies. And we have got to step in there. We've got to help them do that. And um, what we do about it, the number one thing that we do about it is we connect a veteran with a hometown veteran mentor. I call them a guide that helps guide that new veteran through that transition process. We joked, uh, Nick and I joked a minute before about coal range and the Nightland Nav course at Fort Benning. If you're following and LJ, thank you for sending me this. If you're following an asthma and at night, you know, there's these little glow in the dark things on here and you have to keep there. I can't even see now because I don't have my glasses on. There's a little glow in the dark dot right here. And there's one on the end of this compass needle. And because you're not always going to be going north. So what you do is you figure out the azimuth you're going to walk on. You dial it until the north seeking arrow lines up with the azimuth you want to walk on. And now you follow that azimuth. You, ju you just follow it straight. And, and if there's light, you peek through the end and you line up a tree or a hill or a house or something. And, and you walk towards that to stay on your azimuth. But when you're doing it in the dark, no moon, no light whatsoever. It's so dark that the only way you can walk in a straight line is when you come up to one tree, you have to go around the left side of it. And the next tree, you have to go around the right side of it so that you make sure that you're always correcting back onto that azimuth. If you're a degree off of that azimuth for 100 meters, you're going to find what you're looking for because 100 meters at one degree off isn't bad. But if you follow that azimuth one degree off for 10 miles, you're completely lost. You're not going to be anywhere near where you need to be. Transition to me is the same kind of thing. If you have a veteran that is heading off of an azimuth that is going to be successful for them, and within the first three to six months, they're a degree or two or three off, and we can grab that veteran and help them get back onto that transition azimuth, whatever that is for them, and we figure that out, then they're going to have a much greater likelihood of achieving that civilian life filled with purpose and hope. But if they go off one or two degrees for five or 10 years, now what I am seeing from veterans that have been out for five or 10 or more years, they, they, they have broken relationships. They have a history of, of jobs that are unsuccessful and they have become more and more unsuccessful as they've gone on. So maybe they started at one job that didn't work out. So now they had to take another job that was maybe not so good. And then, and they've had to work their way down to jobs that, where they could get hired because of their uh, previous problems with their prior jobs. And we see financial issues that have cropped up because, you know, if you have relationship issues and you have employment issues, you're naturally going to have financial issues. And then you throw on top of there, the fact that the VA loves to throw all kinds of pills at you to numb your body and put you to sleep and wake you up. And then just like Nick said, you self-medicate with some alcohol. You have a, rec a recipe for disaster. And five or 10 years down the road, that's where a veteran starts thinking about eating a handful of pills or putting a 45 in their mouth or jumping off of a building or putting a noose around their neck. Three times this last week, I have spoken one-on-one -on -one with veterans who have tied nooses around their necks and thank God were either unsuccessful or they decided not to step off of that chair because I love the quote where in the book, and, and I did, I wrote this down word for word, like it's really hard to, to forget, but, and I'm gonna put my glasses on because I can't see it because it's so hard to forget this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, to I got this, I got this, I got this. Nothing externally to Ranger Irving changed. The only thing that changed was what was in his head. And that made the difference between life and death for him and for a bunch of his Ranger buddies. 
that exact same thing happened. That's that's a one degree correction on that azimuth that brings them right back. So I could talk about this for a real long time, and uh, anybody that's heard me knows that I can talk about this for a real long time. So I'll just shut up right now. I've got one more little set of of uh, things to play for you here. Let me jump over and see what I got. And um, on that Run Ranger Run, go jump on runrangerrun.com and check out the uh, the program that we put together. There are um, state coordinators now that are out there. There's going to be a kickoff event in Savannah and one in Columbus, and we're trying to get one put together for Tacoma. That's going to be a competition between each one of the three Lion Ranger battalions. Um, and, and this event, this kickoff event for Run Ranger Run on the 31st is all about awareness. And it's a competition between the three battalions to see who can put in the most miles on that one day. So you don't have to be a ranger. You don't even have to know a ranger. But if you want to dedicate your miles on that day to one of the ranger battalions, you can do that. And runrangerrun.com will show you how to do that. Next week, there probably will not be a show. I say probably because I'm going to be at Chacho. Cha and uh, I am, however, going to take my interviewing equipment with me, and I'm going to come back with some great footage. I've already talked to Marty Scovlin by email. I've not met the man face-to-face. -face. Heck, I haven't met Ranger Chris Bemis face-to-face -face yet, so I'm really looking forward to getting to, uh, to spend time in the physical presence of these men who are heroes to me that are making a difference in other veterans' lives on a daily basis. So uh, I'm going to let this run. One of the uh, the pieces on here, the second piece, is Chris Bemis talking about what happened to him. And then that will conclude the show. Thank you for being here today. We'll be back uh, two weeks from today. We've already got some great guests that are lined up. So stay tuned to the New American Veteran, either on the Facebook page, which is New American Veteran on Facebook, or you can find everything you need to know by going to gallantview.org on Facebook, Gallantview, and on Twitter, Gallantview. Thank you. This is Aaron Childress with Chili Off the Grid, Dish Network, channel 266, Tuesday nights at 8.30 p.m. Central. And you're listening to the New American Veteran on Vets on Media. What do you stand to lose when you make the choice to drink and drive? Your career? The people that you love the most? Your ability to walk? your ability to use your hands. The list goes on and on. What do you stand to gain when you make the choice to not drink and drive? You stand to gain everything. I made the choice to drink and drive. And that's some of the things I lost. Learn from my mistakes. Make the right choice. Don't drink and drive. Rangers lead the way. Again, that's Madison Rising.
Thank you for listening to Gallup Fuse, the New American Veteran. Special thanks to Michael Broderick, Tim Abel, and Madison Rising for permission to use their audio recordings on this broadcast. That rendition of TAPS is a public domain recording created by a soldier or employee of the United States government and as such is not subject to copyright protection. This has been a production of Gallup Fuse, the New American Veteran, a proud member of the Vets on Media Global Network, all rights reserved. Learn more about Gallant View at www.gallantview.org.